Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back. We're live. It's, uh, it's either 1 o'clock block on a given Monday here for research in Manoa. And we have two researchers. Now we have Christopher Schwartz and we have Greg Stewart. Uh, they're both at Seymour. And Seymour is the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education. You're impressed, aren't you? This is not a household word, you know. <laughs> yeah, nicely done, Jay. But we, so, we see so much of Seymour, and we see so much of Dave Carl uh, that we, we like Seymour, and we like anybody who works at Seymour. So before this, you probably, you know, didn't like viruses. You may change your mind about that. Okay, so we have two slides we want to show you to sort of orient you with what's going on in viruses in the ocean at Seymour and on the Kilo Moana and the KOK, whatever it is, those two ships that are UH ships, and you guys go do research at Station Aloha with those ships to find out more about viruses in the seawater out there. Hmm. Um, and I mean, I wonder if the viruses out there are the same as the viruses in the middle. Yeah, it's a big question for us, how uh, different viruses may be adapted to different habitats. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this reminds me of a show we once had about something about computers, and so we got a call and the guy said, you're talking about computers, but you haven't talked about electricity. What, <laughs> <laughs> what is electricity? And I turned to my, my co-host and I said, this one's for you. <laughs> so, Christopher, what's a virus? So a virus, uh, it's basically the, the simplest forms have a genome composed of nucleic acid. So this is the, the molecule that contains the blueprint for how to make another virus. Um, and that is packaged within a protein shell to protect it from the environment until it encounters its new host. Uh, so that's sort of the, the simplest form, just the blueprints protected in a protein shell. Of course, viruses can range greatly in size um, and complexity, um, which is part of uh, what we're trying to learn more about, mm -hmm. the, the diversity um, of these different viruses in the environment. Are they, are they living? So that's, I know that's a hard question. <laughs> I, I think you know, some would, would uh, simply just say no, uh, although others, there has been some debate uh, when you look at some of these more complex and large viruses. Uh, but they are very distinct from cells which are living. Uh, so, so typically they're considered not living um, because they don't have chemical metabolism to create energy and maintain mm. themselves. <clears throat> and we know viruses cause colds and worse than diseases, Ebola for example. Um, but uh, are all viruses dangerous and deadly to human beings? The vast majority are not. Um, if you look at the majority of life on the planet is microbial. So bacteria and other single-celled organisms. And because they're numerically dominant on our planet, the viruses that infect those organisms are dominant within the viral community. OK, and you guys are studying viruses in the ocean. It's, it, you wouldn't consider it a microbial thing, would you? Is a, it's a virus microbial? Or is that a microbe? Is a virus a microbe? <laughs> <laughs> well, as, uh, a virus is a virus. Okay. As he said, that's on this threshold of are they living, are they not living? I like to think of them more as molecular parasites rather than living organisms. Uh, so I'd hesitate to call them a microorganism, even though they're down in that size range that you find other living cells like bacteria and protists. And why do we want to study them? Well, because they control everything. Okay, now, you know, it was amazing to me to find out that 98% of my body was water. I found that out when I was younger. But then it was more amazing when I found out that a good part of my body is bacteria. Yes. That, was, that was also shocking. But then I found out that, no, it's also, it's, it's viruses. So the good part of my, viruses, my body is viruses. Yeah. So can you place viruses, you know, can you help us understand where viruses fit in, you know, in the landscape of, of life, of human beings and other life or in, our, in our world? Where are they? What do they do? Where can I find Well, we them? think viruses probably arose. The first viruses were there at the very dawn of life, whenever the first cells arose. 
there were probably these parasitic elements that were taking advantage of what the cells were doing in order to replicate themselves uh, more simply without opportunistic. Care. Well, opportunistic. Uh -huh. So they've probably been there from the beginning. Although new viruses probably have arisen uh, over the billions of years that life's been on the planet, new ones may arise. But I think the first ones were there at the very beginning. Do we need viruses? Well, if you like being human, then you're very happy about viruses. Because viruses have been driving evolution since the dawn of life. And you mentioned how, you know, we're surprising to find out how much water we are and then how many microbes are in and on us. And then there are viruses associated with those microbes, which aren't harming us, but actually probably helping the microbiome. Uh, but then you don't think about just the organism. You look, think about the genome of the organism. And the human genome is just littered with uh, snippets of uh, endogenous retroviral elements. So past, over millions and millions of years, past uh, viral infections that get into cells, tinker with the, the genome, insert themselves in the genome, cause gene duplication, gene interruptions. They're essentially architects engineers of genetic material, and they're constantly infecting every form of life on this planet, every day, every second. Viruses are interacting with host cells and basically doing genetic experimentation, and we're one end product of that experimentation. So all the mutation you hear about uh, in the DNA and all that, that's got to have a virus involved. I mean, a virus is responsible for the mutation of the DNA? Not all of it, but they are, they do have some, uh, major influences and well-known mechanisms by which viruses can influence genetic material. But they're not responsible for every uh, genetic mutation. But they're part of the mix. Yes, they're a major part of the mix yeah. of how DNA changes. And then once those DNA changes, that's when natural selection can interact with that to drive evolution. Why, why do you want to study this? I mean, do you have to wear gloves? <laughs> it, more to keep ourselves clean, uh, or keep, our keep the samples clean, clean yeah. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, working with viruses that infect microbes, because viruses are very species specific, uh, they only infect usually one type of species and very closely related organisms. Uh, we don't have to worry about them harming us at all, uh, which makes working on marine viruses uh, much more. Uh, I guess, easy and, and uh, yeah. enjoyable. Yeah. And we don't yeah. need to wear the biosafety level four and the spacesuits and everything to handle them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because we know they can't infect us because of their specificity. Yeah. Most of them out there in the ocean. Unless you've got contamination from sewage or something spilling yeah. into the water. If it's just the natural marine community, um, those viruses aren't going to harm us. And that's a good thing because there are so many out there. Well, that's, yeah, I wanted to get to that. Yeah, there's, there's a million, billion, million, billion. I mean, how many are there? 50 million in a teaspoon in a of seawater. And then the next teaspoon, another 50 million in that And one. not all the same kind. Not so all the same kind. Vast diversity of all different types of viruses and sizes and different types of genomes. Um, Seawater is loaded with them. Loaded, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we have an image to help try yeah, to drive that Yeah, let's, let's look at images now. So let's see, oh, look at, oh, geez. Yeah, so that's my finger with a small, you see that whitish clear plastic cube on the tip of my finger? Uh -huh. I cut that cube out of plastic to represent a very small volume of water. So if you had a drop of surface seawater approximately that size, a tiny little drop of seawater, and you took some DNA stain to make DNA fluorescent, so you could stain all the microbes and viruses in there, and then squashed it flat, and looked in the microscope, you would see what you see in the background, which is those bright green dots, which are all the bacteria in a drop that small. Those are all bacteria, and then the teeny tiny little specks like stars in the background behind yeah. that, there are yeah. 10 times more of those. Those are all viruses that you get in a single little drop of seawater like that. It's about a thousand viruses in each drop and about a hundred bacteria. Are they naturally green or is that just the way it was stained? That's because of the fluorescent stain that we added yeah. to the sample. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they are teem the ocean is teeming with them. So every time, it's nice to think about that when you're out there swimming. Every time you get a speck of seawater on your skin that size, you can think, my gosh, there's a hundred bacteria and a thousand viruses in that drop. And we go out and swim through it. Thank goodness, viruses are very specific. So none of those ones we They're saw not there will attack you. Us. But you should still take a shower after you swim. Still always a good <laughs> idea to take a shower after you swim. So if Station Aloha and those ships, the university ships, 
go out, what, a couple of hundred miles away from Oahu? And 100 some, kilometers north. 100 kilometers to the northwest, I guess, northeast, whatever, up there. So there's a lot of teaspoons of water yeah, a lot. <laughs> between here and there. And are they all diverse? In other words, if there are 50 million in one teaspoon, there'd be an awful lot of water between here and Station Aloha. So, and then if I expand that to all oceans, all seas, there's an awful lot of diversity in viruses. I mean, it's like incalculable. Yeah. And there's a huge number of... Yeah, yeah. and to some degree, that's, uh, it, it's going to be correlated to the community of organisms living in that ecosystem. So the more diverse uh, the microbes and other organisms in that system, uh, it's more likely that the viruses in that community are also going to be more diverse because they're species specific. So more different things to infect, so more possibilities for different types of viruses to be there. So if I go out into the woods, say in Manoa, and I, my wife is really good at this, she can identify pretty much every plant that's there. If I go out into that teaspoon, can I identify every virus that's there? Do we know? Is there a little book of viruses I have known? Uh, <laughs> do we know what's in the teaspoon? Uh, crudely, I would uh, say. Uh, a large, a pretty large fraction of the viruses that we see are those that infect bacteria. And a lot of those we have a better handle on who they are. You can, you can get some clues just by looking at them because a, a, a large proportion of the viruses that infect bacteria have certain morphological characteristics, like tails of differing sizes and types that you can look at and say, ah, oh, okay, I can identify that to the family. Just by level. shape. Yeah, just by, by shape. the shape. We're going to see some, aren't we? Yeah, but that only gets you so far because you can have extraordinary genetic, at the DNA level, they can be extremely, uh, quite different, uh, even for viruses with a similar shape. And the problem is, I don't know what the fraction is, maybe half of them have those recognizable shapes. The rest just look so simple. Uh, a lot of the viruses have very simple morphologies, so you would have no idea if these two things you're looking at with similar shapes are closely related or not. It's pretty tricky. So that's why we do a lot of work with uh, DNA sequencing and RNA sequencing. You're looking at the, at the DNA of the virus. Yeah. And distinguishing it and yeah. seeing what its characteristics DNA are. DNA or the RNA, depending on the type of virus. That's pretty yeah. exciting. Yeah. Electron microscope? What? Yep. Also, how we yeah. do the morpholo morphological assessment or how do they look? We need to use an electron microscope. So you microscope. can distinguish, yeah. 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 So um, you guys uh, were, you wrote a paper. We have a slide about this. We have a, a graphic, don't we? What, what's the next graphic? Why don't you show it? It's, it's, is it about the paper? Ah, so it's about viruses. Oh. Shows some examples of those electron uh, microscope images on the right-hand side, and uh, these are all viruses isolated from either Kaneohe Bay or Station Aloha, um, and these all infect different types of phytoplankton. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see cultures of phytoplankton. Um, to isolate the viruses, first you need to isolate the phytoplankton. So we grow a diverse array of phytoplankton and then spike in viruses from the environment to try to see if we can infect them. Um, and then that leads us to this varied assortment of all sorts of viruses uh, with very uh, large range and sizes. And, and that, those are the viruses at the right of this yeah, graphic? Yeah, exactly. And, yes. and that's, that's, that, that's a relative size. So you have one that's really small at the lower right, and you have one that's quite large in the top left. Yeah. Exactly, those are all using the same scale, so you can directly compare their sizes. And these are all ones that you've isolated yep. on different species of phytoplankton growing in waters around Hawaii. Got a diverse array of different types of phytoplankton, there are many different kinds. Grow them up, challenge them with a virus sample, and see if the culture dies. Well, I know with, with plankton, I can, I can grow that, yeah. right? I can, I can grow it. And with bacteria, I can make a colony and, and grow that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can I do that with a virus? Can I have the virus replicate? Can I control that and have lots of virus from one little virus? 
To do that, you need uh, you need that host culture, so that plankton culture, need that the bacterial host. culture. Because they're always opportunistic. They need a host in order to. It's the only way they can the replicate. Yeah. Um, so that is their source of material and energy is that cell. So you have to instead of you know like with bacteria, we put some nutrients in a petri dish, and the bacteria grow on that. For a virus. The cell is the medium on which they mm -hmm. grow, so or within which they grow. So. It doesn't make you want to like virus, though. They're opportunistic, they're predatory, uh, you know. But, yeah. but you guys, in, you discovered one that had not been discovered. That's the big story here. Um, what's the name of the virus you discovered? Have you given it a name? So we call it Tetracelmus virus 1, or TETV1. Um, because it infects a green alga from the genus Tetracelmus. Um, and this is one that's considered to be quite large relative to your average virus. So some would call it a giant virus. That makes it more interesting, no? That's um, right. You say put course. giant in there. <laughs> it makes it exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and they are big. I mean, we knew there were large viruses before, but it's only been in, I don't know, what's it been now? Two, 15 years? 15 years already. I mean, time flies. Uh, but that's still relatively recent when we started seeing this upper limit of how big a virus can be start to creep upwards. And it's ah. been pretty exciting because the bigger they get, the more they can do. And, you know, our conception of viruses, you know, we used to say the average size of the virus in the ocean is around 50 nanometer. And these things are 10 times bigger than that. Yeah. You know, so it's like we used to think viruses are the size of a marble. And now we're finding basketballs. Are they are they all related, Greg? Could it be that all the viruses, like it's like all the dogs in the world, you know, are dogs. They're the same species. They're you know similar yes. DNA and all that. Are all viruses related? Did did one little virus start way back when and mutate into all the multi-million kinds of viruses we have now? That seems unlikely. Uh, which is another thing that distinguishes viruses from all the living things or all other organisms we know of, that there seems to be a common ancestor for all living organisms. Viruses are different um, because it appears they have arisen multiple times uh, at different times. There are big clusters of types of viruses, like a lot of the double-stranded DNA-containing viruses. Uh, they have double-stranded DNA as their genome, just like we do in all other living organisms. Those viruses seem to have some common ancestry for most of them. Yeah. But then you have entirely different types of viruses. So they have can... RNA for a genome, which is unheard of in the world of organisms, living things. They've got a single-stranded RNA, could be double-stranded RNA, could be single-stranded DNA. This is the part where I tell you my head is beginning to hurt. Mine too. And, uh, <laughs> no, you're, this is your profession. <laughs> it's hurting okay. from excitement. <laughs> Greg, Greg Stewart is the, uh, the leader of the laboratory. Uh, Chris uh, Schwartz is a, a researcher there defending his uh, PhD in, in short order. Wish you well on that. We're going to take a, a short break so I can deal with my headache. <laughs> and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk more about your paper, your discovery, and what's out there what you have found. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just kind of scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up, and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Hello, I'm Yukari Kunisue. I'm your host of the new Japanese language show on Think Tech Hawaii, called Konnichiwa Hawaii, broadcasting live every other Monday at 2 p.m. Please join us, where we discuss important and useful information for the Japanese language community in Hawaii. The show will be all in Japanese. Hope you can join us every other Monday at 2 p.m. Aloha. Okay, we're, I told you you're coming back, and I feel better now. I'm beginning to <laughs> integrate all this information. So we, we have the slide of the paper. Yeah. Yes. Can we look at the paper? 
so we can see what, okay, what is that? Is this the title of your paper, you guys? Uh, this is actually more of a summary description um, of the paper, uh, but there's the uh, information for its publication in virology. Um, so let me, let me unpack that. Genomic characterization, we're looking at the, the genetic structure of this virus. That's right. It's a novel virus. Is that, what, what does novel mean? Is it because you just found it or, or because it's different from anything we ever found before? In this case, it's uh, the first from this family that infects this type of organism. Um, so there, there are a few from this family that we, this type of virus family that infect algae, uh, but none that infect this type of algae. Uh, but other characteristics that make it novel are the genes that it encodes in the genome, which are genes that we haven't seen in viruses before. And that's one of the exciting things about studying these so-called giant viruses is that their genomes are so large, they encode so many genes that a lot of them are able to manipulate their host in different ways than, than the simplest viruses wouldn't be able to. Uh, so the bigger, the smarter. Uh, smarter may be the wrong word. Okay, well, can we see it again? Yeah. There's more words we have to unpack. Okay, giant, we, we talked about that before. And infecting, you know, you use that and uh, the tetracelmus is the kind of green algae that you're using for the, for the, the, the experiment. Exactly. But when you say infect, infect is, you know, it gives me a, a little cold chill down my... <laughs> infect is a bad thing, isn't it? Is, does infect mean damage or destroy? What does infect mean in this context? For these algae, um, because they're single cells, an infection almost always means uh, death or lysis, that the cell, after the virus replicates inside of the cell, it reaches a limit and then it bursts the cell and those viruses are released. Um, there are other infection strategies that viruses can employ. Uh, for example, perhaps environmental conditions aren't suitable for growth of their host, so they'd rather hide out inside the host until conditions for growth of the host are better in which case they can sort of integrate their genome into the genome of the host and divide with it. So they're sort of lying dormant, um, and we call that... Different strategies. Different strategies. And different damage to the host with different strategies. Yeah, in those The cases. sleeper would not immediately damage the host. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It could be an example for, for humans, for example, an, an aggressively lytic one for one strategy would be something like e Ebola virus which just gets in, replicates, lyses the cell, causes damage, spreads to other cells, infects, lyses, and just rapidly spreads and killing cells. In the larger context, isn't that silly? Why, mm -hmm. if, if, the, if, the, if the virus was being rational, why would the virus want to kill its host? Wouldn't, wouldn't it want to preserve its host so it could continue to feed off the host? I'm, I'm yep. really, you know, uh, These are great, unknowledgeable about this, but I'm just asking. Great questions <laughs> and puzzles in thinking about viral ecology is thinking about, well, you're right. In some sense, if the virus is absolutely dependent upon its host to replicate, and yet it's killing it, that seems to be really detrimental to self-preservation by the virus. But, uh, so you have to think about what, under what conditions is that strategy useful and it tends to be whenever you have lots and lots of that particular host around there's a high concentration of those types of cells around therefore the virus that's going to do the best is one that gets in makes copies of itself say a hundred new viruses pop out and all of them can quickly find a new host and infect that a new person in the, in the case of Ebola yeah uh, but it will tend to burn out because you'll start to run low on hosts. But it's a self-regulating thing because as the host concentration goes down, the ability of the new viruses coming out to find another host to infect drops dramatically, and this epidemic infection then will subside until the host can recover, and then it starts over again. So am I right to, to think that one of the, at least one of the things you're after here is to understand the dynamics of viruses in general. Um, um, this is one way to do it with the, the giant virus and all that, but you want to know more about viruses because viruses do affect humans. And although these viruses would not affect humans, you learn lessons from studying these viruses that might help 
yeah. been studying viruses that affect humans, not, am I right? Do you think about this? Yeah, it is all related. Our main motivation is more to, yeah, it is to understand the incredible diversity of viruses that are all around us. We focus on the ocean, but they're everywhere. Uh, and understanding how they influence life, including humans. So some of this novel principles we may uncover studying marine viruses uh, could apply to what we know about human viruses. Is this a, a fast moving area? I guess it is if you're working at the front of it right now. It um, is. And like five years ago, did we know what was going on here? 10 years ago, did we know what was going on? Uh, in terms of, yeah, I think. Well, the, you know, the dynamics of viruses that you're studying yeah. right now. Yeah, we, we had a pretty good idea. It was, I think this field and marine viruses in particular and viral ecology in the environment like in seawater probably really started taking off slowly around 1989, 1990, which is about when I was starting grad school and I got hooked on it. Uh, and since then, it's, it's taken a while. It's sort of one of these slow burn things and then now the research is really heating up and it seems like uh, it's hard to keep up these days. It was, a lot of, it was a lot easier when I first started. I feel bad for Chris because uh, the literature coming out on this topic is enormous. <laughs> not a past, reading. <laughs> past decade, it just keeps going up. Well, it's just where else is this happening? I mean, Hawaii and uh, Seymour, great place. So West, uh, HIGP, I mean, these are, world-class organizations here yeah. working at the front end, but is it is other people in other schools doing similar research? Are they also looking at um, novel giant viruses the way you are? Yeah, yeah, um, all across the world and trying to find these giant viruses in different environments too. Um, there was even a study that found giant viruses in permafrost um, that was, I think, close to 20,000 years old and they revived it infecting this amoeba organism. Uh, so, yeah, I think especially with today, the genetic tools that have advanced to the point where it's very affordable to, to sequence viruses, um, as Greg mentioned earlier, it's hard to really learn that much about them just looking at their morphology. But now that we can easily sequence their genome, uh, we can learn about them so much quicker, learn about their diversity in the environment, and then looking at specific specific viruses sequencing their genome, learning more about what individual viruses can do that others can't. Exciting, exciting to be involved. Exciting to have you in the studio, although I am gonna take a shower later on. <laughs> so let's look at the rest of your slides sure. so we don't miss anything. Let's see what else we got. What's, what, somebody tell me what that is. So on the left here, um, we have rather green water that was photographed in Waimanalo. Uh, during a bloom of green algae, which we suspect is Tetracelmus. And when we say they bloom, basically the nutrients are high enough that these green algae reproduce so rap rapidly that they reach high concentrations and accumulate uh, to the point where the water turns green. Um, and on the inset on that image, you can see the Tetracelmus cells, those green little cells. That's through a light microscope. Yeah, and the, and the little picture, uh, the, the insert on the right-hand side looks like a picture of what we saw before. Exactly. It's the same virus as was on the er earlier picture, yeah. Yeah, so that's the virus um, that this study uh, That's the one you're studying. Exactly, and the larger image is that Tetracelmus host. It's an infected cell, um, and it's where we cut the cell in half pretty much and look at what's inside of it. Um, so that's imaged using a transmission electron microscope. Uh, so this is the inside contents of an infected cell. And you can see those little balls um, in the middle of it, which are the virus particles uh, that are reproducing. Uh, sometimes it's referred to having a virus factory where they're being uh, produced and assembled within the cell. What about the three big balls, the four big balls at the left, what are, the, what are those? So those, I'm not too certain whether those are, uh, yeah, you can. Uh, uh, some other organelles that are probably normal parts of the, mm, normal, normal parts, parts of, of the, the cell. cell. So you can one see, cell, yeah. yeah, you can see this layered structure on the electron micrograph. You know, where, see where the arrow is pointing? Yeah. Just to the left of what it's pointing at, that layered structure there? Yeah. That's the chloroplast. 
which is what the cell uses. That's what Tetracellus uses is to do photosynthesis. That's How the big light is the cell? So these range uh, around five to eight microns, micrometers. Uh, so how big can is you that? Give me a comparison <laughs> so I know it, how wide that big uh, is. Do you have a slide of that? So human we hair? do. Human Actually, hair? the next we have slide. A slide. There we go. Give you a sense. Okay. Let's, okay. <laughs> ah. I, I, okay. <laughs> So th these are actually different images overlaid on each other um, so that we can directly compare the, the size of these different things. Um, as you can see, the, the human here um, and the size of these tetracellus cells, those uh, little green balls relative to the human hair. Um, and then in the background, if you look closely enough, uh, there are sort of these light green dots. And, and those are the tetracellus virus, the TETV uh, virus particles. Um, and those, that particular image was taken by staining their DNA with that fluorescent stain where they show up as green. Um, yeah. And you're probably thinking to yourself, wait, you said this was a giant virus, Yeah. but those are tiny little, <laughs> it's all relative. It's exactly. all relative. <laughs> they call them giant viruses just because they are uh, bigger than uh, the average size of most viruses. Um, and they are the, what we call giant viruses, or those that get up into the size range of other living organisms, like small bacteria. Yeah. Okay, what about uh, Kaneohe Bay and Waimanalo here? So TETV was isolated from water uh, in Kaneohe Bay, and we can see blooms of its host in places like Waimanalo, uh, like the image earlier. And, and here we have a, a few different examples showing that green water uh, from the extremely high concentration of these cells, these green algae. Um, and so the, the, the picture on the left, is that, that is, that's the water with the algae? Yes. What's the picture on the right? Uh, another water sample. Okay. Yeah. It's the Those same. Those are all examples of same how condition green, of algae. Yeah. 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 And exactly. that becomes important for the fact that this particular alga frequently grows to such high concentrations and population densities is part of, we think, what's important about understanding the ecology of the virus as okay. well. And the most sort of novel and interesting thing about this particular virus is that when we sequenced the genome and we're looking at the, the genes encoded, we found that it had the code for enzymes used by the host to do fermentation. So they had enzymes for green alga fermentation pathways, um, which was really surprising. Why would a virus want to keep these genes used in, in algal fermentation? Um, and one of our theories is that it could actually help the virus spread through these algal blooms. So when algae reach extremely high concentrations, um, it increases the chances that that environment might go hypoxic or the oxygen concentrations might go so low that they might need to do <clears throat> fermentation, uh, which is to, to create energy in the absence of oxygen. Uh, so in this cartoon shown on the slide here, you can imagine you've got this bloom of the green algae. If a virus were to try to spread through such a bloom, these cells would start lysing, releasing organic matter. Now that becomes food for bacteria living in that same environment. So they start chewing on the organic matter and that draws down oxygen even further. Um, so yeah, bacterial, releasing all this organic, the bacterial concentrations in the water go up and they're respiring, just like we respire. The bacteria eat organics, blow off CO2. We eat organics, blow off CO2. So it'd be put, like putting, you go from one person in a sealed room this size to put 100 people in suddenly you seal all the doors and windows, the oxygen level will start to go down uh, just because of the respiration. So the bacteria are using oxygen and releasing CO2. We're, we're about out of time, you guys, um, Greg and Chris. Um, but I just want to ask you one question. Again, I'm totally naive about yeah. this stuff. Um, well, there, there's the credits of the National Science Foundation and the uh, SOWEST and, and CMAR. That's an appropriate slide. Yeah. My question is, you know, for years um, we tried, including in Hawaii, there were a number of firms that were financed to do research and investigation into making lipid oil out of, al al out of algae. 
Okay, and they couldn't actually come up with an algae that would yield sufficient lipid oil um, to, to make it work in a commercial setting, like for jet fuel and that sort of thing. <clears throat> Can these viruses have an effect on the bacteria and the algae in order to change the characteristics of the algae? Um, could you, could you um, actually do, could you customize an algae mm -hmm. using the techniques you're looking at now? Is it possible? Yeah, viruses are frequently used as tools for genetic engineering. And it's certainly possible that if you've got a virus that infects a certain specific host that you're interested in manipulating, having a virus that's capable of injecting its DNA is one possible way of manipulating the genetics of the host system and changing its metabolism to do what you want. And can you actually change the virus? Can you splice the genes in the virus to change the way it engages yeah. with the host? Yeah. And therefore, the, how it might change the host? Yeah. That's, ooh. Absolutely. Ooh. Yeah, and it's interesting both from the idea of using the virus as a tool, uh, but it's also useful to know about the viruses that infect uh, organisms that are used in uh, biotech for producing yeah. lipid oils, or in this case, Tetraselmus is used as a fish feed. A lot of um, these uh, applications involve growing things at very high concentrations, and those are just the kind of conditions where a viral infection can really mess you up. It'll so get exciting. in, wipe out your product. So exciting, um, so much here. Yeah. It sounds like this is only, a, it's an art form only beginning, a science only starting. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Greg Stewart, uh, Chris Schwartz, thank you very much for coming down. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Great thank you.